Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean of the Haas School of Business. Welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series, co-sponsored by the Berkeley Culture Initiative. This is an incredible honor to introduce today's speaker, Indra Nui. There is so much that I could say about Indra. As the first woman of color and immigrant to run a Fortune 50 company, Nui is certainly among the world's most admired business leaders. We are just so honored to have you here with us today. As CEO of PepsiCo, a role she served in from 2006 to 2019, Indra was the chief architect of performance with purpose. PepsiCo's pledge to do what's right for the business by being responsive to the needs of the world around us. This included limiting its environmental footprint and empowering its associates and people in the communities it serves. For more than a decade, Indra directed PepsiCo's global strategy and she led its transformation, leading a number of mergers and acquisitions. Prior to becoming CEO, she served as PepsiCo's president and CFO beginning in 2001, when she was also named to the company's board of directors. Today, Indra serves on a number of boards, including Amazon, Philips, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and the Partnership for Public Service. She has received, get this, 15 honorary degrees and numerous awards. She's include, including the government of India's Padma Bhushan, the country, one of the country's highest civilian honors. In 2019, her portrait was inducted into the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Indra has been named to the top of more lists than we have time to talk about today. Forbes world's 100 most powerful women, Fortune's list of most powerful women, Forbes world's most powerful moms, and the list goes on. <laughs> in 2018, she was named one of the best CEOs in the world by CEO World Magazine. Today, she stands strongly behind efforts to initiate policy for family-friendly workplace initiatives and a care infrastructure that addresses the needs of essential workers for whom it is not possible to work from home. Thank you so much, Indra, for taking the time to speak today. I am so looking forward to this conversation and a very special thank you for providing a copy for everyone in the audience. Can you all raise the book so she can see that you have it? Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, the audience of your new book, My Life in Full, Work, Family, and Our Future. So I'm now going to turn the conversation over to Jenny Chapman and Samir Srivastava, who are the co-directors of the Berkeley Culture Initiative and who will lead today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, this is a really lovely day for me. I, I consider myself to be an Indra Nui groupie, and I've, I've tracked her career for a while. I hope this won't make you creeped out. But <laughs> And um, I, I talk about her career and her leadership all the time in my executive leadership classes. So it's really um, a wonderful experience uh, to, to have a chance to interact with her directly. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive into the, the questions. Samir and I are going to trade off in asking questions. Um, and at the last part of the hour, we're going to uh, invite a couple of audience members to ask questions. Our first question really starts at the beginning of your, of your book, really, which is, you know, you moved from, from India to pursue an MBA at the Yale School of Management. Um, and I'm interested in how your early childhood experiences affected your motivation to do that and how you thought that, how you identified that as a possible path. And then additionally, what was the biggest surprise for you in moving to the US? Hmm. Jenny and Samir, thank you for hosting me. And it's a privilege to be at the Haas School. You know, I've been reading all the rankings and the write-ups of all the business schools. And I must tell you, the Haas School is, flag is flying very, very high. So thank you for inviting me to speak to your students. Um, 
You know, in many ways, uh, people who read my book say, oh, I can see myself in your story. And uh, so I am a story that's very common for people who grew up in the time that I did. At the same time, they go, how come you were allowed to do as much as you accomplished? And so let me talk about both. Um, in many ways, I grew up in a very traditional conservative South Indian household in the 50s and 60s, because I was born eight years after independence. And the remarkable thing about my growing up and where I won the lottery of life was that I was born into a family where the men in the household believed women should be allowed to study and do whatever they wanted to do. And even more, they kept pushing and prodding us to dream big, to soar, to you know, imagine anything you wanted to be because they were going to make it happen for you. Now, you would expect that the mother of the household, you know, in typical homes, the mother is very strong, would put an end to all this and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the girls married off at age 18, which was a normal marriageable age. My mother was conflicted. She would have loved to have been a CEO herself if she knew what it was, uh, but she wasn't even given the opportunity to go to college. And so on the one hand, she had a foot on the brake, which said, I got to get you guys married. On the other hand, she had a foot on the accelerator, which said, hey, why don't you dream and soar and do whatever you want? So I think the heavier foot on the accelerator from three people allowed me and my sister to actually do whatever we wanted. My sister took a very traditional path of being a great student. I was a decent student, but I did wild things like playing in a women's cricket team and climbing trees and playing in a rock band and doing all that stuff. The interesting thing was, in our family, nobody knew what business was. Nobody knew what it was. And so, you know, everybody was either an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor or worked for the government. And that was a dream career, nine to five job, weekends off, you know, you have a steady paycheck. And then my sister gets admitted to one of the best business schools in India. And then all of a sudden, life changes. Because if she went to that business school, I have to go to another business school, because otherwise, I don't want to be viewed as a failed sibling. So this inter-sibling rivalry pushed me to do other things. And then, you know, one thing led to another. I went to business school in India when I was too young. Uh, I graduated from business school in India when I was 20, which is impossible to mature. So I worked in India for two years, and then watched how business and society interacted constantly and how we are losing that whole societal issues when we teach business. And Yale had just opened its business school, which is the Masters in Public and Private Management. And I applied on a whim, knowing that I wouldn't get in and I wouldn't have money to go. And somehow I got admitted and got a bunch of loans and scholarships, and the rest is history. Great, thank you, Indra. So I want to fast forward now to um, a later point in your life, one that mm -hmm. many people here uh, in the room can relate to, which is when you were at the Yale School of Management and you were interviewing for uh, summer internships. <laughs> and um, at the time, Indra was under some significant budget constraints and had to go shopping for clothes. And just on the budget she had, couldn't put together an appropriate outfit for interviewing and for the job. So she ended up wearing a sari for uh, that entire summer internship and was the only person in the office dressed that way. So thinking about that uh, story, Indra, which really stuck in my mind in reading your book, I wanted to ask you to comment a little bit about how you navigated the tension between trying to fit in to corporate life in America, but also standing out and being true to yourself. Well, it's interesting because there's an important part of the story. I bought a really god-awful pantsuit, which in <laughs> retrospect was just so bad, but that's all I knew. Uh, that's all I had the financial resources for. And I showed up in the interview room with all the people dressed in brilliant business clothes, and everybody had a sartorial seizure because they couldn't believe that somebody could walk in dressed the way I, I did. And I, did, I conducted myself you know, with great um, confidence in the interview, the first interview I was in, and I was sure I wouldn't get the job. I came out crying and I spoke to the uh, development office and I said, why is everybody laughing at me? She said, have you looked yourself in the mirror? It's quite a sight. Uh, I said, well, this is all I have. This is all the money I had. Nobody taught me how to, how to buy clothes because those days there was no support system for international students. And she said to me, she said, look, what would you wear in India if you were going to an interview? I said, I'd wear a sari and I have a whole bunch of saris. She said, you know, go ahead and wear the sari to your next interview. 
And if they can't hire you for who you are, then it's their loss. So the next day I had an interview with Booz Allen Hamilton. I wore a sari. And the funny part is I got the job, the first job I interviewed for it because God awful clothes. I got that job and I got the consulting job too. So, you know, this again showed I'd come to a new environment of meritocracy, if you want to call it that. So when I started my summer job in good old Chicago, I had no money to buy clothes because you have to get a paycheck to buy clothes. And I still don't know, didn't know how to go shopping for clothes. So I wore saris through the entire summer job. And I actually declined uh, a visit to go visit the client because I said the client was in Indianapolis and I didn't want to create any jarring moment where they focused on this exotic being walking in with a sari. So I chose to do all the work from the office and let the rest of the team go off and uh, meet the client. And I think the key thing, Samir, is I was drawing attention to the work I was doing rather than how I was dressed or where I came from or what I looked like or how I sounded. I said, those are all immaterial. I can change those things. Let's just focus on the work. And as long as I do a good job on the core assignment, forget everything else. And I must give credit to Booz Allen because that's the way they treated me. I was the only person in, as they put it, costume in the entire Chicago office. And not once did one person ask me any uncomfortable questions or make me feel bad. They really, truly, you know, were inclusive and included me in every meeting in the office and, you know, treated me like one of their own. So on the topic of inclusiveness, um, which is a big one, and I think uh, our students are feeling the weight and the heaviness of um, needing really to to uh, become leaders of inclusive environments, which is not straightforward. It's a very complex undertaking. Mm -hmm. You know, what advice do you have for business leaders in terms of creating inclusive environments where all people feel that they have a seat at the table? You know, I think you've got to look at this whole issue as a war for talent, rather than saying, I'm trying to hire for quotas and I'm trying to hire just to be socially responsible. I mean, we're all in a war for talent. And if you're looking for the best and brightest, the only request I have is think like an economist and cast your net wide to draw from the entire talent pool. And don't start off by saying, I don't want women. I don't want people of color. I'm just going to recruit from this group of people. Don't say that. Say, I'm going to draw from the entire pool. And I honestly believe that if you approach hiring on a uh, blind basis in terms of blindness to backgrounds or ethnicities or looks or whatever, you'll end up with a very different workforce. Then if you start off saying, I don't want group, you know, group that comes from this background or this gender or this orientation. Uh, I don't know how we get there though. That's my challenge. I don't know how we get people to really sort of put a, a blindfold and interview people. But that's the way we have to approach talent, especially at a point when we are so short of great talent. And women in particular are just killing it in schools and colleges and universities and professional schools, getting all the top grades. They're hungry. They want economic freedom. They want the power of the purse. Why not let them soar and why not draw from the whole population? I just think our whole mindset has to change. And I think we all have to accept that having people who look like you and think like you and talk like you around the table may lead to easier decision making, but not necessarily rich decision making. And I think we have to focus on what kind of voice around the table leads to a rich decision outcome. And I think that's you know, diverse voices. Research has shown that. Great, thank you. So um, now jumping ahead a little bit further to the time when you were CEO at PepsiCo, among the most consequential sets of decisions you made had to do with mergers and acquisitions and the integration of acquired companies. So Tropicana, for example, Quaker Oats. Um, and as you thought about those processes, I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about what role culture played in your assessment of a target organization, and then how you thought about and what lessons you learned about cultural integration post-merger. Well, that's an interesting question. Let me start with Tropicana, which we bought way back in 1997 or 1998. Um, you know, PepsiCo is what we call a fun-for-you company. And, you know, as we launched diet products, we're a little bit of a better-for-you company. But at that point, we had nothing that fell into the area of good-for-you. 
anything with positive nutrition. So Tropicana was our first foray into good for you. And the biggest fear we had was we would make the good for you a fun for you product. And I'm going to talk about the mistakes we made. So when we bought Tropicana, which was based in Bradenton, Florida, the first thing that Roger Enrico said is, nobody from Frito-Lay or Pepsi should go visit Tropicana because you will destroy their culture. So he was very judicious as to who was allowed to go to Bradenton and visit them and talk to them and give them ideas because um, if you start to deploy the fun for you culture, pretty soon it's buy one, get one free. It's uh, you know changing the packaging to be more fun for you kind of packaging. Now, let me tell you the bad part of the story and then what we had to do to reverse it. Uh, for the first two or three years, we managed to keep it aside and not allow people to tinker with it. Uh, a couple of years after the acquisition, in the context of people movement, we moved some people from Frito-Lay to Tropicana. Overnight, we went to dropping prices, buy one, get one free, a lot of trade spending. I mean, literally, it, it's remarkable how a strong culture can go in and destroy, or I shouldn't say destroy, radically change another culture of a smaller company which had years of a good for you culture. Okay, first thing they did. Second thing is when you let the Pepsi guys go in, they looked at that Tropicana brand and said, wow, if we could only launch a Tropicana soda, it would be awesome. And they launched a Tropicana soda. And guess what? That business became several hundred million dollars. Now all of a sudden, Tropicana was in the fun for you and good for you space. And no brand can live in two diametrically opposite spaces as Tropicana existed. In fact, it confused the consumer. So one of the things I had to do when I became CEO was shut down the Tropicana soda business and take Tropicana back to its good for you credentials. So I'll say to you, it's not just what you do to an acquired company right after an acquisition. It's what you do to nurture it and sustain it and enhance it over time. Because it's the reason you bought the company as opposed to starting it on your own. So you've got to be very cognizant of, of what you pay the acquisition premium for and how you amortize the premium and what part culture plays in that premium amortization. Uh, thanks, that's super interesting backstory. Um, a major theme in your book is the role organizations can and should play in supporting working parents, right? Something that you know personally. And so a question is, what, what would you have leaders do to foster um, this support within their organizations? We'll rewind a bit and then hit, you know, play. Um, I just look at corporate pyramids, okay? And I look at how steep they are. I mean, that's the reality. Anybody who thinks it's a cylinder is wrong. It's a very steep pyramid. If I look at PepsiCo, at the entry level, there's about 15,000 managers, you know, entry level managers. And by the time you get to one level below the CEO, there's about 15 or 16 people. And one person becomes the CEO. So think of how the pyramid narrows. And in every stage in the process, you've got to outdo people to last, right? The world is changing. You've got to be a lifelong student. And while being a lifelong student, within the job, you have to outperform the other people who are all trying to move up the pyramid and last and get to the top. Now, between the second and third layer is the prime age where people have to really show their mettle. But it's also the age at which people who want to have families go off and have kids. So I often say the biological clock and the career clock is in conflict with each other, especially for women. So what happens is we have the biggest attrition in the second or third layers of the company, which is a tragedy because we bring in such outstanding women, but to lose them because they have to choose between career and family is a problem. You don't parachute in women CEOs. You have to grow them which means you've got to build that pipeline. And right now, the pipeline is broken. So the big aha for me was when people said, why don't you replace yourself with a woman CEO? I had two problems. One is I had brought up women CEO, built the pipeline. They left early to take on the CEOship of smaller companies, which is much less of a challenge than a big global company like PepsiCo. The second is there weren't enough of them because they too had left the company 
earlier to go have uh, you know a family which I appreciate and I support. But here's the problem: we say family is female, so the female always leaves to go have a family. First problem. Problem number two is we never have good return ramps to bring women back if they took time off to have kids. We have on ramps and we have off ramps. The return ramp is not well developed. And the third problem we have is we somehow think that you you have to separate family and work, and there's no way to integrate the two. I beg to defy. I actually think if you provide support structures for young family builders so they can keep their job, their paid jobs, while caring for their families, you can actually deploy all the extraordinary talent in the growth of the GDP. So what do we need to do? Paid leave is something. It's a human issue. It's not a political issue. I don't know why it's being tossed around like a political issue. It's a human issue. Um, we need children. We need families. If we don't have children, we won't have a population growth. We won't be able to support the aging. So we ought to look at having children as a national imperative, not as a uh, discretionary, as, you know, discretionary uh, activity. So paid leave is essential. Um, flexible work hours. The great thing about COVID is it taught us what flexibility is. But let's not jump to say you can have infinite flexibility or everybody comes home. We don't know yet what the resting point for the future of work is. We have to experiment and figure out what the right resting point is. And of course, the third thing that I am just shocked we don't have enough of is quality, affordable, available childcare. And if we don't really think about that in a more systematic way as a country, I don't know how we're going to enable young family builders to have a family and engage in paid work. Now, I'll be honest with you. Um, some people would say uh, families should figure out themselves what childcare they want. They can't, whether it's the executive level or the front lines. You know, even the executive levels, we have a choice to be flexible. You take a factory worker or a nurse or a senior care caregiver, they don't have any flexibility. They have to show up at work. If they have kids, how are they supposed to take care of those kids on a salary that is just below living wage? When the childcare costs as much as 70% of their salary sometimes. You know, it doesn't work. So I think this is a moment of reckoning. Everybody knows we have a problem, but nobody is willing to act on it because you know, it's, it keeps getting pushed down the priority list. But I think as a country, we have to think through between companies, you know, small and medium-sized enterprises, between government, between NGOs, every entity, we have to think about how to make childcare a national priority if we want to fill the 11 million jobs that are open right now. And more importantly, as the population ages, if we want a workforce to take care of the aging, we better start worrying about childcare for women in particular who you know, do most of those jobs. Thank you. Um, so if one reads your book, one will see there are several themes that you are really passionate about. We've talked about working parents. Uh, there's also healthier eating, uh, the climate and then the environment. And in each of these cases, you as a leader had some personal passions, but there were also external forces operating on PepsiCo. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how these two forces, the internal and the external, came together in helping you choose when and how to tackle these issues in the context of Pepsi? Well, you know, PepsiCo itself, we undertook a fairly significant transformation under performance of purpose. But the first thing I'd say to you is transforming a company when there's a problem is much easier because the burning platform gives you a reason to transform than transforming a successful company. And my observation is that transforming a company in trouble, you can articulate the case inside out. Transforming a company that's successful, you have to make the case outside in or future back. So in our case, I looked at, I had teams looking at the big mega trends that were going to impact the consumer products industries, food and beverage, and PepsiCo in particular. And based on 10 mega trends that I thought were going to be significant, we went about saying, how are we going to transform the company? There were three mega trends that were significant, that were going to take time, money, capabilities, and risks to make happen. The first was transforming the portfolio to have an equal mix of fun for you versus better for you and good for you. So really transforming a portfolio that was iconic, but 
was perhaps a step behind the times because the consumer was shifting to health and wellness. That was a risky move, required new R&D because we were tinkering with formulae. But I must say that was perhaps the most important part of the transformation we had to get done. The second was uh, the environmental issues. You know, our products are sold in uh, foil bags. They're sold in one-way plastic. Uh, you know, one-way plastic was the dominant late motive for a company like PepsiCo and most of the beverage companies. Yet, there were real concerns about landfills, about plastics washing up on shores, littering, uh, you know, sides of roads. And we had to commit to reducing plastic, reducing water use in our plants. We had many, many plants in water distressed areas. How can we justify using two and a half liters of water for a liter of Pepsi? It just doesn't work. So we had to reduce our water usage. And with as many trucks we had on the road, we had to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Interestingly, putting in solar fields and going to renewables for our plants, piece of cake. Going to hybrid trucks, easy. Uh, for Pepsi, it's harder because the, the package is heavier, so you can't go to hybrids. But Frito-Lay, overnight, they went to hybrid trucks. Um, plastics, we went on a long-term plan to reduce uh, plastics consumption in our facilities, in our packaging. And water usage, you know, we put all the scientists to work on, you know, waterless washing, you know, using lights and things like that. All kinds of interesting technologies came about. The third big plank that was a big work in process was people. You know, people didn't want to work for consumer products. They wanted to work for tech, financial services. So we had to attract them into PepsiCo. And what we did when we talked about performance of purpose and talent sustainability being a big part of purpose was it gave people a reason to come to PepsiCo. Because we said to them, we're going to create an environment where you can bring your whole self to work. The cost of hiring pales in comparison with the cost of losing somebody after you've trained them. So we wanted to retain people in our industry, in our company, and we wanted to get the best and brightest. You know, and we wanted to allow them to have a family, still work in PepsiCo. So we set up on-site or near-site childcare. We gave people flexible hours. You know, we did everything possible to make people feel like they could have a family. They could have a life and a livelihood. That's what I would say. And that worked well. Uh, you know, all the feedback one got was that people loved the on-site and near-site childcare. They loved the flexibility we gave them. To a certain extent, not infinite flexibility. We still needed them in the office so that we could, you know, get to know them, build a culture, have innovation thrive. But on the margins, we gave them enough flexibility to make home life happen. And uh, had I stayed around longer, uh, I might have tried putting it in all our factories. But I was exhausted. Um, so, so I wanted to stay on the performance with purpose focus. Um, you know, we at the Haas School developed four defining leadership principles that uh, that we really focus on and adhere to. Um, they're actually etched in our building, if, if we mm -hmm. can ever welcome you to the mm -hmm. Haas School. Um, confidence without attitude, students always beyond yourself and... <laughs> did, they, did they say it? What did I leave out? Question the status quo. Question the status quo. Question the status quo. I was just uh -huh. testing, making sure. Jenny so developed all, them, by the way. All so of yes. our students yes. know about these. And there's a, uh -huh. you know, there's a, we took a stand um, and it actually differentiated us among the top 10 business schools. And our students who are there now had to write part of their admissions application um, about the way that they connected with our defining leader principles. And mm -hmm. we have about 180 of our processes connected to the defining leader principles and so forth. So there is a, you know, a brand component to it, an external reputation component, and also an internal culture component. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I wanna understand how perform uh, performance with purpose played that kind of role at, at Pepsi. Um, can you talk a little bit about your motivation for creating this orientation, um, how the organizational culture fit with this redirection of Pepsi's strategy, um, and really how you led um, through the establishment of performance with purpose and kind of embedded it into the organization. 
have performance purpose did not fit the Pepsi Cola culture because you know it was a radical transformation in so many dimensions. And I was not sure it was going to succeed, but I knew that was the right thing to do. Uh, and I think as I looked at the mega trends and looked at the whole issue future back for the company to remain successful for decades into the future, I knew we had to change. There was no, no doubt in my mind. And I made the case to the board in a very well thought through document. And they bought into it and they said, absolutely, this is the way you've got to go. We are behind you. Um, then I had to sell it inside the company. You know, typically when you sell these big transformation programs that are long-term in nature, that could, you know, go through some bumps Along the way, you've got to appeal to people's heart as much as you do the heads. So I framed the whole agenda, not just as you know, mega trends and future back. I related to every one of them. I would say to them, look, um, look at the products you consume. Have you shifted your consumption to health and wellness? What kind of products do you feed your kids? Would you like a landfill today to be the foundation of your home tomorrow? Because that's the way you've got to think about it. So when you start to make it very personal to people, all of a sudden they go, you know, I want to make the world a better place for my children and children's children. You're right, we have to make changes. This is the only way to go. So even our skeptical divisions got on the bandwagon and said absolutely, fully buy into it. So when, you, when you're articulating the rationale for a change program, you can't just make a, a presentation and just deliver a deadpan. You've got to make it your missionary zeal come out of your body and you almost have to go there and um, uh, make such a passionate case for it. And you might just have one or two chances, not too many. And if you can't storytell, if you can't really get to people's uh, innermost feelings, you'll never be able to get them to change. Uh, in the first, I would say, four to five years of the transformation, inside the company, I managed to convert most of the people. Not just me, I had a whole bunch of opinion leaders, were my senior management, who all went out and did it. Our investors were more skeptical. And this is where, you know, confused the hell out of me. We teach corporate finance and business schools. We teach discounted cash flow. DCF has three parts. Short-term cash flow, long-term cash flow, and terminal value. Yet we only focus on the first three years of cash flow. Investors only care about the first three quarters. What has happened? It's the same people we tell our business schools that go on to be in investing jobs. Why have they forgotten the long-term cash flow and the terminal value, which unfortunately has a disproportionate impact on the valuation of a company? And if you deliver extraordinary short-term value without investing for the long-term, there's gonna be a boom splat. Investors like boom splats <laughs> because they sell out before a splat and they buy before the boom and ride the alpha. That is a wrong way to create shareholder value. So we have to drill that into all your students. So I come back and I say, if you're going to manage all three pieces of the discounted cash flow, which we all celebrate, how do you ensure that the company's cash flow stay robust for a long time? It's by judiciously balancing level and duration of returns. So you're reinvesting in the company and you're constantly renewing it. I would love, uh, Samir, for you to teach a course on the failed corporations and why did they fail. That's not a course that's taught anywhere that I know. One semester, take every failed corporation in the last 30 years and ask the question, what did they do wrong? Study it and give you volumes about how they knew a technology was going to up in them, yet they didn't invest because they had an old model they had to protect. The toughest thing to do, old model you have to protect. As they would say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's what they kept telling me. So the first three or four, maybe five years of my CEO should be very painful because people didn't understand why I had to make the change, even though I articulated. I'm talking of outsiders. But they did not want to go through this transition. Give me, give me, give me everything you can today. That was the sentiment. In the second five years, they said, my God, she was so prescient. She did everything right. How come we didn't see these trends? You did, except you practiced them. You just didn't want companies to practice them. And then the last two years, they handed me all the awards. But I wish they supported me in the first four or five years because 
of course we're the toughest years, you know, you're a new CEO and you're trying to make change. And that was a time that, no, I had enough criticism. That's okay. If you want to make major change happen, you've got to be resilient, you've got to be courageous, you've got to be able to face the criticism. And our board faced it, I faced it, but we stayed resolute and together. So we have a great idea for a new elective course on failed corporations. Um, oh, yeah. well, can I just add also, you might want to add into that course, uh, exotic financial instruments doomed to die. <laughs> I think that might merit its own elective. Um, well, that is true too, yes. absolutely. <laughs> So, um, Indra, just sticking with the performance with a purpose, um, I think we can all look back at the changes you made and acknowledge that you moved Pepsi in a positive direction, both uh, in terms of society, health, and so on. And yet, you could imagine a skeptic or a critic saying, but did Pepsi go far enough? Yeah, we still have an obesity epidemic in this country. We still have a climate change crisis. And uh, as you look back, do you think that you pushed as far and as hard as you could have, or do you think that maybe there were some uh, opportunities left on the table still? Well, PepsiCo cannot be the only company doing it. The industry has to change because this is an industry that has been pushing for years to process food more and more and more for several reasons. One, it improves shelf life, it reduces costs, and by adding more fat, sugar, and salt, you can add more flavor. That's been the formula for, every, for industry. So, you know, here I come into this industry and people are already calling me Mother Teresa. And I go in front of the, uh, you know, manufacturers and retailer organization and I make this impassioned plea to them saying, we have to change as an industry. What if we committed to reducing the calories that we put out to the consumer without sacrificing taste? So after a lot of tugging and pulling, the industry comes together, manufacturers and retailers. We agree to take out one and a half trillion calories from the US diet in five years. And in three years, we take out four and a half trillion calories. In five years, we take out six trillion calories. Measured by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which was our biggest critic. So as an industry, we did the right thing, right? But as PepsiCo, I would have loved to reduce the sugar even more, but at the end of the day, I can't tell consumers how to eat and drink. What we can do is nudge them to the right behaviors. And you know, we had Cash Sunstein come in who wrote the book Nudge, which I would honestly urge you all to read. We had Cash Sunstein come and tell us how to nudge consumers to better choices. I mean, I'll give you one uh, experiment we did in, uh, in, in a inner city bunch of stores where there was a very high obesity level. This is PepsiCo doing it on its own, even though we were a fraction of what we were consuming. We decided to price up the regular Pepsi by 20%. So the diet Pepsi had a much lower value. And we thought, hey, pricing is a nudge. So people look at this and go, I'll buy the cheaper product. People would go searching in the store for the regular Pepsi at the higher price. And before they used to be line priced. You see, it's nothing to do with price. We almost have to educate people how to eat and drink healthy. I mean, they've been in food deserts for as long as they have. All of a sudden, overnight, you can't just turn on this lever called pricing and say, here's a new choice for you, lower price, can't do it. So it's a comprehensive change that has to be done, fix the food deserts, teach people how to cook and eat, improve the quality of school lunches, so I would say PepsiCo could have gone further, and we did. The amount of salt we reduced in our salty snacks was astounding. But if I told you, you'd say, oh, yeah, now I see why it tastes different, although it doesn't. We reduced sugar in all of our core products. But the real thing is to make a difference in society, companies have to come together like we did. But more importantly, I think it's critically important that we educate consumers about eating right, living right, the pandemic should have been a wake-up call. Interesting. Thank you for that. Um, we have one, one final question, and then we're going to hand it over to uh, two students who are going to ask questions. So our final question is kind of a, a 
a catch-all. Um, you've already talked about some of these, but given your success in so many different industries and in so many different roles, um, is there anything else you want to say about your biggest lesson in building and sustaining a strong, effective culture? This is this is our focus in the Berkeley Culture Initiative. Um, and any additional thoughts that you'd like to leave our students with? I think the single biggest challenge for any leader is developing pipeline of leaders. And that's one thing people don't do very well. Uh, I think... Um, you know, we don't take the performance appraisal process seriously enough. Uh, and we do a perfunctory job giving feedback as opposed to a uh, sincere, deep feedback process where we write down what they do well, what could they do better, what do they have to demonstrate next year, how are you going to help them get to this next stage. Because a leader's legacy might be the business or the financial performance they leave behind, but a much more lasting legacy is the pipeline of leaders you've left behind. And I think that that's not getting the attention it deserves unless you have a failed CEO succession. That's when it gets the uh, you know, time and attention. So one of the things I would plead with boards of directors, I'd plead with senior executives is really focus on pipeline building. And it doesn't happen the last two or three years at succession, you know, when succession starts. You've got to build a pipeline for 25 years and say, uh, here's a group of people who could be CEO in 25 years. Watch them, nurture them, develop them, put them through assignments, you know, and then take them out when you don't think they'll make it and put others in, into the pipeline. It's a funnel that has been managed for multiple years and handed off from leader to leader. And if that is not embedded into the DNA of a company, I think CEOs are being let off the hook. Great. So let me go ahead and invite Kanso and Drew, our two student um, speakers to come up with their questions. And we'll have some time after their questions for audience Q&A. So if you have a question for Indra you'd like to ask, please queue up behind the microphone in the back, and we'll turn to you next. Um, Kanso. Should I look here? <laughs> or should I look up there? Uh, you can look out to the audience, okay, cool. yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. So first, I just want to say thank you so much for coming uh, to speak with us. Really enjoyed it. Um, my mother went to medical school in Uganda in the 70s, and one thing she reflects on is how women in her class, on average, outperformed the men in their first year or two. But then as both began to get married, that flipped. And something you talk about is the importance of you know, helping women in lower levels of management to move up the pyramid to senior management rather than falling off. Um, so what is one thing or two that you would like to tell the women in this room um, and listening in as we embark on our own managerial pursuits, especially in the context of balancing family and career? The, the first thing I say to all the women in the room and all the young family builders, not just women, is that you know, family, having a family is a wonderful thing. It teaches you about love in profound ways, but it is a tether. It's a tether for life. It's a lovely tether, but it's a tether. So you've got to go into it knowing that that's what families are for. Great support mechanism, but it's a tether. Um, do not say that, I wish I could have had a family, but I really wanted my career. I think companies, uh, you know, uh, government organizations, NGOs, everybody has a responsibility to provide a support system for you. Do not have to make that choice because we need you in the workforce. We have a huge gap in available people and talent to, you know, power the economy. And so we need all of you in the workforce. So no longer think of yourselves as a discretionary uh, pair of hands. You are a necessary pair of hands. And therefore, uh, you know, demand, dialogue, uh, you know, with all the people that need to be talked to about providing the support structure. Whether it's childcare, whether it's flexible work hours, whether it's paid leave. I think it's incumbent on leadership to put these mechanisms in place because we need all of you in the workforce. I sincerely mean it. Now, if you don't want to be in the paid workforce and you choose to you know, be a stay-at-home mother, that's also okay. That's your choice. But don't do it because you don't have a choice. Thank you, Drew. Hi, Indra. Hey there. One thing that I find extremely problematic is that the, most of the burden to create change and dismantle the unfair systems that we have in place in our society fall largely on women and people of color. 
So I'm interested in your perspective on how we can get buy-in from those in power to uplift and sometimes even relinquish their own power to make way for those who have historically been excluded. Tough one. You know, you have to be very secure in senior levels to allow people to sort of push you off your perch. And you say, push me off my perch because it's the right thing for the company or it's going to make the company a better place. Um, I will tell you one thing. How can we make change? I think women can be more united in working together to make change happen. I think in many ways, women tend to be competitive rather than united. Uh, and I'd say that for different ethnic groups too. Uh, if everybody spoke with a voice, at least the majority spoke with a voice and advocated for change, I think we'd see change faster than having splintered points of view, then people exploit those differences. And so I don't disagree with you that uh, there are enough barriers rather than tailwinds for people to move ahead. But the only way to address them is the power of unity rather than divisiveness. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go ahead and take a, some questions from the audience. If you could just tell us your name and then go ahead and ask your question. Hi, my name is Raj V. Mishra, and I'm currently a senior studying computer science and business here at Cal. And my question for you is, you know, consumers often don't really know what they're looking for, or they may have unconscious realization of needs and may not actually be able to, you know, correctly express them. So how do you listen to consumers and to what extent do, they, do you even listen to uh, their needs? Oh, that's a fascinating question. You know, I spent years at Motorola. And when I was in Motorola in 1986 to 90, the cell phone had just been launched, right? And the cell phone that we had, the Dynatac, was this massive device that weighed about a ton. And, uh, you know, it, it was just like a uh, spacecraft telephone. Um, and all of a sudden, one day, one of the marketing guys, a brilliant marketing person in uh, Motorola, comes to see us with a flip phone, this tiny little razor, you know, the flip phone, uh, compact. And all of us looked at it and said, oh, come on, the consumer will reject it. Because they're used to carrying around this dino pack. <laughs> they like the weight of the phone. They like this untethered device. This guy kept saying, no, as long as you can get the semiconductor technology and battery technology to progress, this is the phone of the future. And this is, gets to your point. How do you know what the consumer needs are and how do you develop a product? My general observation is the following. When it's technology driven, as long as you know there is a way to make consumers' life easier, you lead the consumer. If it is not technology driven but more style driven, then the consumer leads you. So you almost have to think about what you're doing. Again, you're not going to offer a product that's flaky. But as long as you think you can make a consumer's life better, go off and take a chance for the product. Thank you. Welcome. Next question. Hi, this is Yu Xing. Um, um, I'm currently a full-time BS student for Haas class of 2022. Um, yeah. And it's a very humbling experience today. Um, I actually wrote about your, um, your achievement in my uh, application essays in, um, to Haas. Um, so. <laughs> Okay. Um, Thank you. So my question is, um, in your... Um, well, I still got in. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, in your sharing, you mentioned a lot about the power of storytelling. And I could still remember uh, in one of your interview was about um, the CSR responsibility and water usage of PepsiCo. You, uh, you weave in the story when you grew up in India, um, there was extreme water supplies. And that story continued to stock in my head right now. So my question is, how do you actually cultivate the capability for storytelling and then make it impactful enough to not people to transform their actions? Ah, that's a great question. Stories that come from the heart, that come from lived experiences that are authentic, are real stories. If you pluck a story from a book or take somebody else's story and just say it, it's contrived. So you have to be very careful how you choose a story. You have to be very careful how, to, how you choose humor, because sometimes a, a joke falls flat because you haven't internalized it and contextualized it. So what you need to do is journalize 
your stories. You know, make a journal of interesting stories that, you know, you have from your life from which you can derive a lesson and just keep it. You'll never know when you can use it. Okay? And just collect a history of stories and don't borrow stories from others unless you're using a story somebody uh, told you to illustrate a point. Always talk from your own experience. And, you know, I remember when uh, we had our shareholders meeting, these water activists would show up from Boston or outside of Boston. They'd come with hundreds of letters to say PepsiCo's using too much water, you've got to change. And they would demand time in the shareholders meeting to make the point. And I would look at all of them and say, have any of you lived in a water distressed area? They'll say, no. I said, let me give you my experience, what I lived through my entire childhood. Who do you think cares more about water, you or me? I live it, I feel it every day when we use too much water. So trust me, I'm going to reduce this water, water footprint enormously. So you've got to have that level of conviction coming out of your story. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for speaking with us today. My name is Suyash. I'm a fourth year undergrad. I'm studying industrial engineering and business at UC Berkeley. Um, so I know you've had a career that spanned more than 40 years and you worked across companies like Motorola, BCG, Johnson & Johnson, and obviously PepsiCo. I'm very curious to know a little bit more about one piece of feedback that you probably got in your earlier early career that has maybe shaped or even defined the rest of your professional journey. Hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I had to learn very quickly is how to give feedback. And uh, for anything, I remember when I was at Motorola, we were in a meeting and the presentation was done and uh, Everybody gave their feedback. When it came to me, I said, oh, that was a terrible strategy presentation because the strategy and the financials don't think, so obviously this is a failed presentation or something like that. And I was so proud of myself because I made the point in an impactful way. <laughs> I got on the plane to go back home. The CEO said, hey, come to the back of the plane. I want to talk to you. So we went there and he said, you know what you did in the meeting? You took this two-day meeting and you destroyed it in the last five minutes the way you gave the feedback. You threw a hand grenade in that whole meeting. And those people are going to hate you for life. I said, but that's the fact, right? What I said, the strategy and the financials didn't, don't, didn't link. What's the point? He said, there's nothing wrong with the content of what you said. It's how you said it. Because I came from a cultural upbringing where everybody said it like it was, all right? I even write about the fact that when we were kids, we would, have, we would put on plays for the parents. Halfway through the play, they would walk out saying, do better the next time. <laughs> That's what they're used to. You, you were never told you did a good job. So you sit there, and now the CEO is telling me, what I would have said is the following. I would have said, you know, so-and-so, your strategy was very well thought through. And really, it's uh, disruptive, and this is the right way to think about the industry. But have we from corporate put too many constraints on you through the financials that makes you you know, struggle to, um, you know, balance the strategy and the financials. Or you could have said, look, as a company, you have to deliver these financials. What aspects of the strategy can we back off from? And can we still accomplish the goal of, you know, gaining share? So he said, you've got to frame this in a more palatable way as opposed to a sort of a dead cat between the eyes way. <laughs> it took me a long time to learn that skill, I'll be honest with you. Culturally, I was not used to it. But, you know, little nuggets like this here and there shape me to be a much better person. Thank you so much for that. You're Great. Welcome. So we're almost out of time. Let's go ahead and hear the last two questions, and then we'll give Indra a chance to respond to one or both of them. Just tell us okay. your names and your last two, and, the, and your question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph, and I'm a co-founder of a company called Tame, which is a B2B marketplace for convenience store owners to buy inventory. And I actually have two questions. One is can how- you ask, Can you ask one of them oh, okay. right now? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's all good. Um, how do we get large brands and companies to partner with us when we're not that big and don't have as much leverage on the customer side, which is the convenience store aspect of it? And how do we get these companies to kind of change their old ways and work with the newer company, essentially? Great, thank you. And let's hear the final, final question. Hi, so my name is Richard Sharma. I'm actually in the Berkeley Masters of Financial Engineering program. Uh, the question that, oh. I, that I wanted to ask was that with a lot of young professionals like going into the industry, a common trend that we've seen is that 
after pandemic, a lot of people were actually like, even after being offered a one-time bonus, surplus salaries, they were like not able to take it just because there was no work-life balance. There was a lot of mental stress. So I'd like to ask you like, what's your code for a near perfect work-life balance or, or is it a myth? <laughs> oh, so let me take the first question and then come to you. Um, you know, big brands, by virtue of the fact that they're big brands, believe they can do it all themselves. And we don't really need to partner with anybody else because partnering with other people is time consuming. And it takes away from our core uh, job of growing the big brand. And unless there is a clearly articulated need to partner with somebody, big brands don't like to partner with anyone. And big brands have extraordinary talent behind the big brands that they can grow the business themselves. So the small company has to articulate a reason why the big brand has to partner with them. And it's got to be a compelling reason. And it's a hard one to do. So I hate to throw some cold water on you, but that's a reality. Um, now let me come to your second question. Um, I'd say that when I was, you know, coming up the corporate ladder, there was no technology. The smartphone had not even been invented. Uh, the internet was in its early stages. There was no Zoom or Teams or any of these technologies. So everything had to be done in person. I had to travel around the world. If my kid's school called, I had to rush over. So there was no work-life balance. It was always work-life juggling. You started the day with one set of priorities. By midday, it was a different set of priorities. By the end of the day, it was a completely different set of priorities. They were always hoping that the balls that you were in the, uh, tossing in the air, they didn't fall. So it was a juggling act all the time. And you built a support structure around you to pick up whatever you dropped. Today, with all these technologies, there is hope that you can have work-life balance. You don't have to travel as much. You can come into the office three or four times of the, of the week, three or four days of the week, and perhaps spend a day at home, working from home, and still somehow manage to have a life. So I actually believe, because of technology, we can go from work-life juggling to kind of sort of work-life balancing. And everybody's getting more sensitized to this right now. My only plea is, as we have discussions about the future of work, rather than just focusing on robo robotics and automation and artificial intelligence, let's put family in the center of future of work discussions. Why does the school uh, you know, start at eight and end at three, while offices start at nine and go to five? Makes no sense. You know, let's start to rethink every aspect of life as we know it, and think about how to make family center to the future of work, as opposed to leaving it in fringe. And I think if we did that sort of thinking, it'll make everybody's life easier, and this discussion of overwhelming stress, and you know, all kinds of mental illnesses can actually be addressed because we're creating a more holistic society. And in many ways, putting the human back in humanity. Jenny, are you there? I yeah. am. Ah, did you want to conclude? The oh, sentence? okay, great, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So thank you. That was brilliant and and full of insights. Um, Indra, you're just a treasure and we're so incredibly grateful that you took the time to talk with us and with our, our wonderful, amazing students. So thank you on behalf of the school and our student body for joining us today. Can we have a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. To you, to Samir, to the dean. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, keep the house flag flying high. We will. Well. And Thank just so a much, final Andrew. note, we have a number of partners from our um, Berkeley Culture Initiative joining us today virtually, and I, I want to say to them and to our students, the Berkeley Culture Initiative will have its annual conference in January this year, hopefully live. Um, we hope uh, some of you will be able to attend. It's a wonderful two-day event with uh, incredible companies in the mix and uh, sort of the cutting edge academic research all blended together. Um, we're also undertaking our first, what we're calling mega study, um, which, uh, which is a study of organizational culture and looking at the impact of culture on bottom line financial performance. We hope to be the 
you know, foundational study in this domain. So stay tuned for more on that. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Indra. Um, have a great thank day. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. thank you very much.